And APB, American Protection Bureau, voted number one best on Long Island for all your security needs. Call 631-390-9050. That's 631-390-9050. APB. The Monty and the Pharaoh Show is brought to you by... Because wine is your second favorite four-letter word. California wine, New York attitude, good fucking wine. Yeah. Hey, hey there, peeps. What's going on? Matty Rock here. Welcome to In the Dungeon with AA, Andrew Anderson, the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan, and our special guest, UFC trainer, announcer, pro wrestler, and talk show host, Matt Granham. Thanks for coming on the show, brother. We appreciate you. Hey, thank you, guys. So I'll use some alliteration to introduce myself to your audience. I am the pernicious purveyor of preposterous pomposity here to manipulate the minuscule minds of the mass uh, masses of miscreants. And you could also call me a paragon of pugilistic punditry. I love it. I love it. And I'm tapping Matt, out because there's too many SAT words at once. Peace. I'll, I'll catch you all on the flip side. I'm out. Matt, we're glad to have you on the show. Man, me and you know each other for quite some time. And I think the first time you and I met was in uh, Charlotte at the NWA Fan Fest. And we got to help yeah. us talk, talk about Phil Baroni, a uh, UFC fighter, Phil Baroni turned professional wrestler, and the in himself, the Hall of Famer, Rob Van Dam. You could, you could tell that story right now because. I, I think oh, uh, yeah, man. it was pretty amazing at that night. Yeah, it was good times in Charlotte. We The hotel we stayed at had the bar, and then there was a bar that was adjacent to it. And uh, Phil and I stayed up um, closing down the bars every night. Uh, no, RVD been- was, was out there with us every night until the bar closed. And then when the bar closed, that bar owner kept the bar open, and it was mm-hmm. open bar for us. First of all, he, he comped all our drinks, which was awesome. Yep. Yep. And he let us stay after, and, you know, we get we're hammered. We're pushing and pulling in the bar, and we go out to the pond. There was a pond out there, and it had a few of the, the fans there from the fan fest. That and, was the river. Uh, I refereed the match. River. That was that little river. Yeah, that little river, that little pond that was in between the hotel and the bar. And I yep. refereed the match between uh, RVD and the New York badass Phil Baroni in the pond. And then during the course of that wild match, I, RVD's phone got destroyed, landed in the drink there. And RVD went to do his fog splash, and there were rocks all around, and he landed face first. Oh. Busted up his face really bad, man. It looked yep. like he looked like he'd taken some shots to the head. And the next day, when we all went down to our tables, the yep. rumors started. All the fans thought that that Phil had uh, had knocked them that knocked them out and roughed them up at the bar. But that's not what really happened. We had a great Just time together. We were having fun. Yeah, yeah. And we I gotta mention having- Phil. I gotta say this about Phil Baroni because I was up in your neck of the woods. Uh, back in uh, August, I was at the Showboat uh, Casino, and I did a, a press conference there with uh, Johnny A., John Ali, who's an old uh, gangster from the uh, Gambino family. But he was uh, just featured on that ABC special that they had last week. And I know a lot of these wise guys down here in South Florida and up there for years. But he has so much history with Phil and Phil's father. And we did this press conference to call out Gotti the third, who is wow. a I remember MMA that. fighter. That and was an it awesome. was a great that was a great press conference because people don't know Phil's background. And it, it's this is I always say to Phil, we gotta do a movie about your life. I say it would be like the, the modern day uh raging bull, because Phil's father was a gold star NYPD detective that uh worked for the Gambino family. And they used his badge to do a lot of home invasions and drug dealer with drug dealers, a lot of stuff. And Phil, when he was younger, lived with John Elite. And Phil was collecting money by the time he was 17. 
you know, he was collecting for the mob. There's that story when he was in college, when he was wrestling at Hofstra, where he got stabbed in the back of the head and moved out to Michigan. And he's had a crazy life. A lot of people don't realize Phil's great uncle was also the late, great Captain Lou Albano. Yeah, I remember that. You told yeah, me that. Yeah. Fascinating, fascinating stuff, man. I'll tell you guys. Um, we, we're, we're, you had another story to tell, to tell Kevin about a uh, connection with you have with Kevin with Bob Roop. Yeah, this is interesting. So I'm with uh, Berman, Berman Law Group. I'm our marketing coordinator, and I write stories for the Berman Magazine. It's, it's TBT, the Berman Team Magazine, and I also host the Berman Team Podcast. We're one of the largest personal injury uh, law firms in the, in the East Coast, on the East Coast. We just opened up an office in Charleston. We're down in Florida. Our main office is in Boca, Boca Raton, Florida. That's where the, um, where the podcast studio is. And I just vetted a case this morning. I was just talking to uh, a guy named William Harding. Does that name ring a bell? No relation to the president that was assassinated. Or is no. there? No, it may be, though. He may be his great-grandson. I don't know. But uh, he's the guy who who broke uh, Bob Roop's sugar hole in the old sugar hole challenge. Kevin, yeah. tell us I, I remember, I didn't remember the name, but I knew someone broke the challenge. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, his story, they, he's telling they me. They had to pay up. He, he studied it. Him he actually dollars. Yeah, he studied the hold for a long time before he went in there. He actually was a martial artist. He was a wrestler, judoka, and he studied that hold to escape it. And he actually explained to me that he revert, kind of reversed it on Bob. And he has a crazy story. You guys may want to have him on to talk about how they tried not to pay him that night and how he eventually got paid because that was wow. a challenge for money. Wow. Yeah, it was $1,000. I remember that. Yeah. Now, 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 Kevin, did Bob get a lot of famous people in that hold? No, uh, you know, they always talk about Stu Hart's dungeon. Stu Hart's dungeon, not, not disparaging it, but it was nothing like when people try to get in the wrestling business in Tampa. Mike, at the time, Mike was about 16 years old and they say try him first and Mike would beat these guys up then they had to go to Briscoe and the both Briscoes then they would go to Roop and then they would go to Matt Suter and these guys left I'll tell you a funny story Andy was so over in Florida Eddie Graham the state senator gave him the flag that flew over the national capital, right? Wow. Well, one day I get there, and in comes this guy. He says he wants to be a wrestler, but he's got a mask on. He comes in and jumps over the top rope, and they send Roop in there. Roop puts the sugar on him, and... The guy's bleeding from his nose. He's bleeding from his eyes. He's bleeding from his ears. Different time, different era. He slapped them, and the guy had a singlet on. And the guy tried to run out of the ring. Bob grabbed the singlet, tried to pull him back in, ripped him naked. The guy ran out the door. He was on 106 North Albany, and the next, right up the street, Maybe a uh, hundred yards was Kennedy, the main street in Tampa. The police picked him up. They thought he was in a car wreck. <laughs> they, came, they came to 106 North Albany with the guy in the back. And they said, we don't care what you do to them physically. You can't strip them naked. <laughs> so, <laughs> They, were, they gave them, I mean, I saw some brutal, brutal beatings there from people. Well, didn't he, yeah. didn't he hear Matsuda to break Hogan's leg? Yeah. When yeah. Hogan was trying to learn how to wrestle? Yeah, and I mean, 
I never understood that one. You take, you know, you looked at a Hulk back then. You knew he was going to make money. Why did you want to break his leg? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it goes back different time, different era, different culture, right? Mm hmm. Hero had been a child in Japan during the war. Uh, they weren't our great ally as they are now. I mean, the, the, I mean, you know, you've, I never met Ricky Dozier, but I, I became friends with Pogo and a lot of the guys that were around then. And they told me how Ricky Dozier would just beat these guys up and they wouldn't raise a hand to them. And on, no. you, on YouTube, you can see two of his shoot fights. He had one against a judo guy. Masahiko Kimura. Oh, wow. Brutal, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. And then, then Anoki had the one against the giant Antonio. Mm -hmm. Oh, kicked him yep. Yep. Hey, yeah. yep. You know, uh, that, that Masahiko, Masahiko Kimura is actually the guy that they, the Gracies named the, the double wrist lock. The double wrist Kimura. lock's been around forever, but they right. named it after after him. And uh, Ricky Dozen beat the hell out of uh, uh, Kimura. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Now, wasn't and it a great fight you know, that beat up Andre, that was kicking Andre's legs out in Japan? Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I'm trying to remember. That wasn't Takata. That was... Um, it was Maeda. Um, Kira, Kira oh, Maeda. Maeda. Yeah, that was my Maeda. Maeda. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Andre yeah. was really drunk, drunk, and they wanted Andre to smarten Maeda up, but Andre was too drunk, and Maeda was kicking the shit out yeah. of his legs. Just kicking his legs, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, we wrote about a lot of that stuff in the book. I did a, a book with uh, Eric Paulson, who was... Uh, world shooto champion and one of my coaches and trainers in, in, in MMA. He was a great man, great guy, great history. He was the only American to ever win the um, the championship, world shooto championship. And that was early MMA in Japan. And shooto came out of uh, professional wrestling uh, from Tiger Mask. And wow. uh, uh, that's, a, that's a promotion that uh, was one of the earlier uh, promotions in Japan and then goes to today. You know, it's, there's still Shuto today. Our co-host, Paddy Rock, co Rock, is a world-famous uh, Prosciutto champion. Prosciutto. Hey, yeah, yeah, there you go. Hey, what's wrong with that? Hey, you know, what's wrong? I, I can jam with the best of the Prosciutto. But, uh, but Andrew just brought up something that I also I find fascinating. Whenever I get to talk to, uh, to MMA guys and mixed martial arts guys, and it's that move from MMA to wrestling. So as a guy who did Muay Thai for – for 15 years and I train people. The whole art is the balance is entirely different. And you know, Andrew laughs and Kevin laughs. When you get into a Muay Thai ring or another ring, your your whole thing is to keep your balance and your feet under you, right? Then you get into a wrestling ring. And I remember literally the first five times I tried it, all I did was roll up into a ball and fall. Yeah. Well, I have a different experience, guys, a much different experience with pro wrestling. I uh I was a wrestler in high school. Got to mm -hmm. actually headline my uh, Norwalk High uh, for the mats. I was our team captain in high school and then in college wrestling. And then I got into judo. And that was how I got into pro wrestling. Before there was really MMA, I got into pro wrestling because my one of my buddies um, at Akari Judo up in Danbury, Connecticut, was doing pro wrestling. And I was said, God, I always wanted to get into it. And, and mm -hmm. we just practiced in, in the judo school. And he took me around as his opponent. And that was how I how I got into it. And I brought guys from uh, from the mat to the ring and had matches that stole the show, like uh, Steve O'Pony, uh, who was a wrestler at Anderson College. I brought uh, Shane Lee when he was at the Citadel. We had a shoot at a show that um, Drew's buddy, uh, Chuck Sloan, did with Angry mm -hmm. Grandpa. It's yep. got over yep. four million views. We had a shoot at the on a shooting night show when we were drinking. We were hammered, and I had coached him in high school 
Um, and all his, all his old high school teammates were around and I had like 20, 25 pounds on him, but I was a lot older. We were both hammered. I was right around 40 when this, in this show. And, um, we got, got in the ring and he, he hit me with a flash double and it took everything I had to get to cradle him. I got him in a cross face cradle, but I was blowing up and he was, you know, embarrassing me, but I've always felt in professional wrestling that it, it make it. And, and this was what one of my mentors, Billy Wicks, told me. He said, work a shoot, you know, and make it look as realistic as possible. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I still don't break kayfabe when I'm doing stuff. I had that feud with Adam Newsom, who was a rival of mine from MMA. And mm-hmm. we kept everybody, we kept it so close where everybody thought that that, that, oh, that yeah. thing was a shoot. Really trying to kill each other in the, in the wrestling ring. It was great. Even the boys you had them worked. Yeah, exactly. You know, that was what me and Phil, me and Baroni said uh, yep. years ago. We started saying, "Work the workers. If you can yep. work the workers, yep. Yep. oh Absolutely. man, Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, that's, I want. I, I, hey, Andrew, I want to interrupt for a second. I heard you say Billy Wicks. Are you talking about Billy Wicks from Tennessee? Yeah. Spot McMonroe, Billy. Yeah, he was like a second father Spot, to me. Spot McMonroe and him. Yeah, he yeah. the biggest house for probably forty years until Hogan came there. Even out drawing Jerry Lawler, Billy Wicks from. I never met him, but I knew Sputnik very well. Yep. And, Everybody I knew said that Billy Wicks was the real deal. Yeah, he's such a great man. He, he you know, it was funny because he had a school in uh, Asheville. This going back like 15 years ago. And it was uh, at the, uh, the old barbell club in Arden. And I used to train there. It was for grappling. It was a shoot school, a lot of local, you know, MMA fighters. And I just knew him as an old man that could, that could stretch guys. I didn't know his, his pro history. And, I, and then yeah. he kind of took me under his wing um, and because he knew I was doing here. I was doing pro wrestling. One of the other guys said, you got to talk to this guy. He's doing pro wrestling. And we became friends um before his death and, and i had a you know he's such a great man such a good guy he actually wrote the foreword for the book i did with eric paulson uh the rough and tumble book gene labelle wrote the other forward because gene was a mentor of uh, of eric's and we traced the history of pro wrestling mma and amateur wrestling a lot of people don't know amateur wrestling pre-1930s before uh uh, Hugo, uh, Hugo Atoplik changed the rules. Um, they had choke pins, and there, there were, uh, it was a lot dirtier, a lot more a lot submissions, dirty. and that went on, on to the carnies, you know? Yep, yep. They, 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 wasn't that when they first started to uh, um, outlaw fish hooking? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, fish yeah. hooks and fish they, they would, choke pins, neck cranks, yeah, arm that, lock, that, twisting arm that, locks. They would call that the era of the fish hook, because that's when fish hooking was still, uh, still oh, legal yeah. to you. Dirty wrestling, dirty wrestling. Carried on. Maybe. You know the the dirty wrestling still carried on though with coaches, and it didn't completely go away. I mean, God, Matt. No, that, that was also a, a, a parallel with bare knuckle fighting. You yeah. know, it was something yeah, that was absolutely. always around. But people, you know, like you and I, you and I, we both had an a, a amateur background, and we both d- did MMA and 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 uh, collegiate wrestling and everything. And, and you know, I mean. But a lot of these kids nowadays, they don't understand what it's like. Everybody wants to be a tough guy, but yeah. they don't know what we went through to get to where we are in professional wrestling. They don't pay Absolutely. their dues you know? anymore. That's it. No one wants to pay their dues. They just want to get where they're and going. I know, I know that Matt, and I know that Matt, and I can speak for Matt with this, that Matt Granahan and I both do not would consider the Cirque du Soleil that goes on to be what we grew up and were trained to do. Right, Matt? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, I'll tell you, Billy Wicks told me when I, he said, this is what you need to tell people on the mic. You need to tell them in the ring that there is nothing I do to my opponent in this ring that I can't do to every one of you slobs that buys a ticket to see me. And that was, that was the way he drilled into me in, in professional wrestling. And 
I, I think it's professional wrestling has lost that. It's lost the larger than life uh, yeah. aspect and and then the reality based aspect. And and I'll tell you, it's it would it would be wise to go back to that because they'd be able to get more of the, the MMA fans. They're doing it a little bit, you know, because they've got Brock in there um, yeah. with um, uh, Bobby Lashley. Now, yeah, Matt, but when, uh, when I when I walk down the street, people know either the freak show is in town or you're a pro wrestler. That's the bottom line. I always said one thing that you and I always had in common. You know what I'm saying? They knew we were, you know? And I also want to throw Kevin into this because Kevin really hasn't really gotten into this. But Kevin, I want you to tell Matt the first time you wrestled Mike Graham, how it came about. They were going to put me and Mike as a tag team. So Eddie said, uh, I want you guys to work out Matsuda had the gym, too. So he said, be there at 9.30. And I get there at 9.30. and says, I want you guys to shoot. So I'm working. And I was a fair amateur wrestler. Mike was very good. But I was definitely holding my own with him. And then I realized I could be cute myself out of a job. So I ended up not that he couldn't beat me, but I don't think he would have beat me as easy as I... We went about 15 minutes, and then he got me, and he pinned me. It wasn't a stretcher or a shoot hold, you know what I mean? And uh, I saw... It's funny. Listen to this. There was a guy named George McQuarrie. He was an alternate on the 1960 wrestling team that went to Mexico City. Bob Orton Jr. had just started out. And he was, I mean, just started out, right? And Eddie would come to, t- I don't matter who booked, me or Dusty or JJ or Tom Ernesto or Louis Tilla, didn't matter. Eddie came to TV. So I'm um, listening to Eddie give the finishes, and he comes up to the uh, Orton and McQuarrie and says, I want you to guys should go out there and shoot. I don't care who wins. And they had a shoot match on te- television. Wow. Yeah. He kept it so tight. Do you know what I mean? Who went that over on that? Who wound up going over? McQuarrie. McQuarrie. You know, he wow. was older. He had, even though uh, Orton definitely held his own, uh, you know, he, funny thing. Uh, Orton had one. One, he went to high school in Florida for a while, and he won the state championship, I think, two years in a row in Florida. I mean, he wow. was definitely no slouch, but when you're going against the uh, alternate for the Olympic team, Olympic it's level, all man. Yeah. the level. Yeah. I mean, uh, hey, listen, I think it's time for us to pay the bills, Maddie. What do you think? Yep, yep. Let's take a quick two seconds, ladies and gentlemen, so we can pay the bills and hear from our sponsors. Catch you back in two seconds. You need a body shop? You need engine repair? Auto Excellence. Collision Specialist. 631-261-6420. That's 631-261-6420. Auto Excellence. Do you treat your dog as part of the family? (laughs) Well, so do we. So why not celebrate your pup's birthday with the ultimate party box? Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Party Pup Info, and let us make your pup's party or any celebration perfection. Hey everyone, welcome back. We got Matt on the show, along with AA and the Taskmaster. Hey Matt, so so Matt, tell us tell us a little bit about your relationship with another wrestler who you were, uh, uh, well, another MMA fighter who you've been involved with, who was, who was actually the world-class wrestling revolution heavyweight champion for quite some time. Oh, uh, Stefan Bonner, the, the American psycho. 
Yeah, and, and this is something <laughs> that I tell you, this is something that I'd like to talk to talk to Kevin about because I know Kevin worked on the uh the booking side as well. I love Stephen Barney. I love Stephen Barner. I met him in California. His interviews were so good, so good. They weren't they were so true. I don't understand why that guy doesn't have a job on top. The guy has energy all day long. What he did, he saved UFC, right? That oh, fight yeah. Yeah. Is the UFC. fight with Boris Griffin, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Didn't he go and for he saved Bellator? He saved Bellator. That's what, he saved UFC. That 2005 fight is what made UFC a right. household name. Household name, yeah. But a lot yeah. of people for, don't realize or forget too. And that's what I was going to talk to Kevin about is um, when I when I managed Stefan Bonner, I was a, a prime marketing consultant briefly for Bellator, and it was right when they went on Spike TV, and it was a crazy time because at Spike UFC had built up Spike. And UFC went and left to go to Fox. So right. Bellator, we were a smaller fight promotion, but we were trying to get those UFC fans. And what I wanted to do, I wanted to take the Stefan Bonner Forrest Griffin fight and have it as a rematch on Bellator. But we couldn't get Forrest because he was in his contract with UFC. So we got the next best thing. We got the guy that was all over the, the news media because of his antics in UFC and his antics with his wife, Jenna Jameson, we got Tito Ortiz. Right. And Bonner is so good at cutting a promo that we brought Justin McCulley in under a mask who had been Tito's old training partner. And we put him in the cage with Bonner. And we didn't even, we didn't smarten Tito up at all because we knew that Tito was going to go off when Bonner cut a promo. And Bonner cut a promo that I would put up against anything that's that on any other broadcast in the last 10 years to set up that fight with Tito. And Tito, of course, attacked him, and they did a pull apart. But Bonner's one-liners in that promo were great, cutting up on Jenna Jameson, and then they took the mask off of McCulley. And it was the only time ever that Bellator beat UFC head-to-head -head in the ratings. They were both on TV that night, Bellator on Spike, UFC on Fox. And we beat them head-to-head -head in the ratings with that Tito Ortiz uh, Stefan Bonner fight, which was a barn burner of a fight. It was a split mm -hmm. decision. The judges gave it to Tito, but it could have gone either way. But it was the promotion and the build up to that. And that's the thing. UFC and, and, and Bellator are doing pro wrestling a lot of times better than pro wrestling nowadays. I agree Absolutely. with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. But here's where my question is, right? Yeah. Why hasn't somebody signed them? Well, Bonner, unfortunately, um, he sustained a pretty bad, bad injury. Um, he's I had a I had a mixed tag match with Bonner and the girls of Blow, the beautiful ladies of oil wrestling, and he loves to come off the top rope with the Macho Man elbow. Now, when he hit it on me, he he it, he landed it he landed it well, but in a match um, last year, it was I don't. It was in the fall. He injured himself really bad. And mm -hmm. he's been actually using a walker for some time. He was in the hospital for, for quite some time. So he's been injured for a while. But it's also, I think, I think Kevin, the other thing with, with Bonner is he had that UFC Hall of Fame career already. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame. And he's he's told me that he just loves. Um, the the indies work in the indies, and I'll tell you guys a real funny story. Bonner's first pro wrestling match, you guys will appreciate this. His first pro wrestling match was in House of Glory in New York mm -hmm. at the New York City mm -hmm. Arena, and I I had booked him for the match. I was calling those matches, I was broadcasting for them, and it was supposed to be against Matt Riddle, and mm -hmm. we got the word three hours before the show that Matt Riddle pulled out. And when I was doing the broadcast, I said, Riddle got a case of pussyitis. Mm -hmm. And it was he was replaced <laughs> by a show Tanaka, right? So the promoter goes to get this, this guy, show Tanaka. He's done some MMA in Japan. He's a, he's a new Japan guy. 
And I, first thing I said was, does he speak English? And I said, oh, yeah. We get there. He doesn't speak a word of English. <laughs> and they had that match um, without him speaking English at all. And I think for Bonner's debut, I think I think that was a great match. He's a natural. He, he's really a natural. He oh, is. He's I a go with the flow kind of guy. He's a really go with the flow kind of guy. He's got his. He's got the basics down in in in, in pro, and he 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 carried. He's actually the guy who brought pro wrestling, in my opinion, to the UFC. He he put the panache into the into Bellator and 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 any and, and and MMA. So he, in my eyes, Stefan Bonner is the guy who brought wrestling into UFC as far pro wrestling into UFC, the entertainment uh, value to it. So I'll yeah. always credit that. You know, Definitely, and, and, Drew, and I would say even before that, Baroni did it with the robes, the dancing. Yeah, the, the look, the look, the yeah, look. But, yeah. but interview-wise, Bonner did. Interview-wise, did. Yeah, Promo. Definitely. You know? Definitely. And, and, we're always, and this, is what, this is where you and I really hit it off because you were always his pitch man. You were always Phil's yeah. pitch. But you were always the hidden gem as far as I'm concerned. And me and you talked about tagging I many me and you talked yeah, about that. I'd love to tag with you. Yeah. Uh, I, I, is that what I'm hearing correctly now? Then I'm going to see it. I'm going to see a tag match happening soon, right? I'd love to tag with you. Me and you know Matt, what, Drew? I'd love to tag with you against. I'd love to tag with you against Bob Carson and George McKay. We should do it. Yeah. We got two fighters. Kevin, Kevin's there. already starting to write emails and make phone calls. I smell it. I smell it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey Matt, before we forget, I know we were talking about your book. Is it, are you able to get your book online at Amazon, or if not, let everybody know where they can grab a copy of it, brother? Sure. We just did a 14-year retrospective with Eric out at Combat Submission Wrestling, and there's a deal right now on the book. If you go to e r i k p a u l s o n dot com, Eric Paulson dot com, where you get the book and you get a really cool T-shirt that goes along with it. Right awesome. on, so everybody remember where you can go get that. We can see you at um, WrestleCon in uh, in Dallas at all. Kevin well, let I... me interrupt. I, I have a book out. My don't, uh, Matt, my wife does. Andrew, take it away. In the... um, book called... I heard uh, about that. Old School by L.A. Taylor. And it's about uh, wrestling the way it used to be. Actually, the from wrestling from its infancy during the old Port City days of... Um, of pro basically, basically, it's wrestling meets the Sopranos. Yeah, it's a. Yeah, it's it's basically, awesome. they can get the book, I want to um, read that. And and I actually wound up sending you something how UFC was originally mob run, how it was started up, and this is basically. Hey, do you know wrestling. how the? Do you know how Dana where Dana White lived? The Fratelli brothers. Yeah, in South. No, right? he yeah. lived where I, my family grew up. He lived in South Boston. He wow. used to have a he used to have a gym where he t for women and guys to get in shape just by doing MMA, not wrestling. You know what I mean? Not hooking up, just yep. the exercise. One day, Kevin Weeks and Whitey came in and said, "You owe us twenty five hundred bucks." He said, "What are you talking about?" He said, "It's the tax." He went home that <laughs> night. Dana went home that night. They called them and said, have it ready tomorrow at one o'clock or something will happen. And they, and Dana said, what do you mean something will happen? He said, you don't want to find out. He, Dana yeah, hung up the phone, made a reservation on Delta, flew to Vegas one way and got away from South Boston. Oh, yeah. And I'll tell you guys something crazy. He he tells Dana White tells that story about leaving South Boston. And there's a and, and that's a great history. But what Dana White never talks about. And this is really interesting, guys. And I'll try to give you the quick Reader's Digest version. A lot of people don't know who the Fertitta family is and the mm -hmm. Fertitta brothers, where he got his money. They used to run Galveston, Texas with the Macy's. Yep. Galveston one of, was one of the most successful mob run cities in America for decades. They made a fortune. They kept that they kept that city clean. They kept crime out. They had the most brothels per square mile of anywhere. They had a beautiful casino. 
um, right on the on the water on the boardwalk, and they ran that city. They ran the shylocking. They ran the gambling. They ran the prostitution, and they had the cops under their under their thumbs. The judge under their thumbs. It was the Texas Rangers that broke that city up, and uh, broke up Galveston. And then the Fertitos went to Vegas. And they are actually, there's characters that represent the Fertitta brothers in the movie Casino. They mm -hmm. started with the casinos. They always reported to Carlos Marcelo it, back in the day, who, um, who was the mob boss out of New Orleans. A lot yeah. of people don't realize uh, I'm Irish like, like Kevin, and I'm also Sicilian. And the first Sicilians came to New Orleans yep. uh, through New Orleans. And um, Carlos Marcello was a very powerful guy. The Fertitta brothers, very powerful. They caught Frank Fertitta, uh, the second, who's their, the father of the brothers, on a wiretap, uh, skimming money. Uh, he did some time for bribery, but didn't do a lot of time. They cleaned all that, all that money in Vegas. And the Fertitas were literally billionaires when they bought the company with Dana White. They bought it from Art Davies, a really good friend of mine, great guy who started the old UFC when it was tournament mm -hmm. style. They bought it in 2000, around 2000, 2001 for two and a half million, right? They sold the company in, two, in, in 2016 for 4.2 billion. So you want to talk about a successful yep. successful mob family and I just want to share one quick thing with you guys that's kind of an inside baseball thing when it comes to the the mob and the fertitas in the UFC. I always said that they used a lot of those mob tactics in the Zufa era of the UFC. I had a fighter that I was a training partner of mine that I managed. She was a hot commodity, one of the best wrestlers in MMA, Kamal Shalarus. Uh, he was undefeated in WEC when they were on mm -hmm. versus. He was signed by UFC when they purchased WEC. Now, the way that the fighters back then, and this is going back some time, the money in it's a lot better now. But this is going back 12, 13 years ago. At that time, they UFC signed you on a three-fight deal, and you only got three fights a year. Okay, so I'm just going to throw some numbers out there. Kamal's was around 8, 8, 12. So 8,000, 8,000, 12,000. First thing Mike Merch from Zufa did is he says, I want to sit down with you and I want to go over Kumar's sp sponsors. Calls them Kumar to kind of belittle them. That's part of how, how they did this shakedown. We went through the sponsors. First one was tap out. Kamal was getting 10 grand. They said, okay, we're taking 6,500. Okay, second sponsor, they took a couple grand. And I'm looking and I'm like, Oh my God, they are, they are profiting, profiting four to five grand on his, on his first fight. And it was like mm -hmm. that way all the way up the card until you got to the co-main event. It was like an amateur show. They were actually making money mm -hmm. on the fights. Uh, and then when it gets to awesome. the money got a lot better, but they Amazing. had a surplus of thousands of dollars. So they were using those mob tactics um, during, and, and I'm not, and I'm not judging them. I, they were very successful. It's just the way it is, but that's something interesting to share to people. And that all changed in 2016 when Endeavor purchased the company. And a lot of people don't know it's, it's Ari Emanuel who the, the entourage TV show was based on the fictitious character um, mm -hmm. Ari, um, who heads the Endeavor, which is the international conglomerate that purchased the UFC in 2016. But they bought it for 2.5 million. They sold it for 4.2 billion. Amazing. Hey, you know what? After this episode, I feel that we're all going to have to go on witness protection. You could call me Sniffles. <laughs> my name is Sniffles Calzone. With me, guys. <laughs> hey, my name is Sniffles Calzone. I love hey, you. Connecticut. The Janice show. Jersey. She's going to tell my uncle fucking Junior to protect us all. As long as you keep yeah. <laughs> and, we, and we keep the freaking uh, the cannelloni out of our mouths, you know. Yeah, we had a good uh, run, right? So, yeah. uh, so, so the first guest on the Berman Law Group on our Berman Team podcast, they want to compete with Valuetainment. So they're, they want to get these wise guys because Valuetainment did the thing with Sammy the Bull and, and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, who's, who's the real scumbag. And, and so I got... Um, Larry Mazza, who was a good friend of mine from the Colombo family, and uh, he was uh, the last guest from Valuetainment. So you guys want to check that out on Berman Law Group. We're not like the movie The Firm or anything, you know, the old Tom Cruise movie. <laughs> hey, listen, guys, while we're at it, I just want to give a, a, a quick 
quick shout out to my friend, uh, Dave Heath Gangrel. Him and Susan Nelson got married this past Wednesday. I was at their wedding in, in, uh, in Hollywood, Florida on the beach. And, uh, and uh, we had the, the, the reception at La Tub and uh, a lot of people were there. Uh, WWE's Rusev, now known as M, uh, Miro uh, from AEW, uh, uh, Sin Bodhi, uh, Tokyo Monster, Cahagas, myself, and- uh, uh, hey, Andrew, Andrew, I hate to interrupt you, but I'm gonna, we wanna thank our good friend, Craig Massey, and wish him well in Saudi Arabia. Hi, Craig Massey's heading to Saudi Arabia too. Um, um, he's heading to on a business deal with Saudi Arabia. He also comes out with us as part of our Dungeon of Doom. Uh, he's an intricate character with us, and uh, he's been with us in SWE, Fury, and in uh, World Class. Uh, also, we want to give a plug out to uh, Linda, Linda Sullivan, L.A. Taylor on her book, um, Old School. So you can get that at Amazon. And, Just and here's, something, that. here's something funny. As Matt, we were was, just talking, we, we talk about Galveston. Port City. There it is. Port City. Yeah. All the yeah. all the old Port Cities were mob run in the old wrestling, the old era of professional wrestling, all the way down to all the uh, to, to Boston, Chicago, uh, uh, New York, Newark, L.A., 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 L.A. Yeah. LA Galveston, Detroit, uh, Detroit, Detroit. Right there. and uh, so it I'll all comes down. So, Ed, Drew, that's interesting because uh, when you say Detroit, because I, I was asked to be on a show um, last week. It's the grandson of uh, Jack Toko, who was the mob boss in Detroit. He has mm -hmm. a podcast. He talks about all the Detroit mob stuff. And he wanted me to come on and talk about the Fertitas and all this stuff. So it's, it's And I funny. just saw that link the other day, the other night. I saw yeah, that, that was the show. Yeah, that's was, the guy there. Um, it was I, I can't wait to read this book that that Kevin's um, wife wrote. That sounds awesome. That's right up my alley. I, I'm, I'm going to get that. You can get it on Amazon.com. I'm going to pick that up. I'm going to pick that up. And I want to ask you guys something about wrestling, though, real quick. I read yeah. a blurb real quick. I read a blurb the other day, maybe it was yesterday, that Shane McMahon has been fired. Um, I, I was just wondering what, what's going on with that. No clue. No clue. Uh, Do you have any? This is my belief. He, he's not fired. He owns a huge amount of stocks. His father's mad at him. Put him in the doghouse. Where's he going to go? AEW? First of all, I would think that Tony Khan wouldn't bring in his competition and put him in the, that position, I would think. And the other thing is, I don't think that the kid's going anywhere. He he, he might have had a bad night, but I'll give Shane this credit. Shane's a hard-working guy. When he jumped off that cage and they carried him out, you remember yeah. that? It's amazing. That was spectacular. He's an athlete. And he put up a thumb. He put up his thumb. He was sending a, a message to the dress room. Guys, if I have the guts to do it, I'm not going to ask you to do anything I wouldn't do. It was mm -hmm. one of the amazing uh, messages I've ever seen. I'm a big fan of his, even though I've never met him. Hey. <laughs> He's an athlete, Kevin. We can see him up at the... Uh... He used to smoke up at the Grand Havana Room in New York, so we'd see him all the time. And he, uh, he's quite the athlete, man. I tell you. He, oh, yeah. Never, he, was never, in, he was impressed. Always very impressive. Great athlete. You know, I, I grew up in uh, Norwalk, Connecticut, right up the road from, yeah. uh, right up the road from Stanford. And uh, the WWE building there, great guys. Um, and I know Pete, Pete uh, Gastarino, Pete Gast. Yeah, Pete uh, had him on my old man. podcast. Right. He's a good dude. Yeah, he's a real good yep. dude. Um, and you know, I never met Shane, but I was just shocked to, to read that because I know he's so integral to the company. But I wanted yep. to backtrack and just tell something else because I think your viewers will find this fascinating too with the UFC. So um, Lorenzo Fertitta, one of the Fertitta boys, was on the um, Nevada State Athletic Commission when. 
da- before Dana was going to buy the company, when my buddy Art owned the company, this funny story Art told me. So they wanted to get sanctioning in Vegas, and that would have driven the value of the company up tremendously, right? Mm-hmm. So the only guy <laughs> that was the holdout that stopped sanctioning was Lorenzo Fertitta. He denied sanctioning, and then 90 days later, they bought the company. So they devalued the company and then bought it. So That's talk great. about, you know, mob tactics uh, there. But man, this is, it's great to be on here with you guys. Uh, I really appreciate your I'm time. I'm so happy with you, man. Um, it's been a long time. You know, the whole COVID thing kept me and you apart for a while. But, you know, we, we've we always had a great relationship, you and I. And ever, ever since that night, that drunken night in, in Charlotte, me yeah. and you had a... Uh, Watch how you say that, buddy. Yeah, uh, we had a good time. Have you, seen, Ch- have you seen Chucky lately, Chuck Sloan? No, I I speak to him occasionally on 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 Facebook, but uh, I love Chuck, man. I miss Chuck. We had a lot of fun over the years. He was he was actually a crucial part of my 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 formative years in wrestling in the early nineties. I wrestled him a lot back then. So uh, you know, Chuck East- goes back to the Chuck goes back to the Monster Factory. Yeah, in uh, in Jersey, the the original Monster Factory. And I yeah, wrestled he has him some- for wrestling for uh, 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 Gino Caruso back then. So yeah. you know Chuck, you know Chuck actually started um, before that down out in Texas uh, with um, uh, Chris uh, Adams. He was Adams, part yeah. of the yeah, yeah. He was part of the same te- the same group with uh, Stone Cold. Wow, no shit. Yeah, he's yeah. Been a, He's a great dude, man. Never never really caught a break, but you know he's always been you know he's always been a great talent and a great guy to work with. And I always I love the rest. I loved wrestling him because Chuck was a, was a really solid amateur. He could follow you. And when two amateurs are going out and you, and you leave openings for each other, it makes for a, a great match. So you're wrestling. You, you, you know, Drew, you leave openings for yep. each other. It makes for a match. And I'll tell you, the first time I wrestled Chuck was in uh, Spartanburg, in APW, and the security okay. guys came up to us. And they said, that was real. You guys, had a, you guys were really, at, really going at it. You know, so when you can fool the security guys, it's it's fun. Him and I used to go all over the building, just brawl. We used to brawl constantly. We just have these both start off wrestling, hold the hold, and then go into a brawl. One of us would yeah. just turn heel the other and just start pounding each other. People like, are you guys really freaking killing each other? We're walking the back, and they were like, oh, there's going to be a fight. And it was, ah, man, man, it was always good working with him, man. You know who Chuck, what- you know who Chuck had some brawls with, too, up there, and we should say RIP, uh, that was up there from your area was uh, Balls Mahoney. Oh, he loved balls. He loved working yeah. balls. John was a great guy. John yeah. was a great a guy. He had know. demons. Balls, you know, a lot of people don't know balls had a, had a good, uh, solid amateur background up there in Jersey. Great amateur background. Yeah. He never had to use it. That's the whole thing. No. But he never had to use it. He found his niche. And once you find that niche, you find where you belong, where you fit in, you use it to the best of your ability. You know, and he he loved the hardcore. He, he, he was a lead all over the yeah, he was a really good guy, but like I said, he had his own demons, you know. Unfortunately, we all have our demons, you know what I'm saying? So if yeah. we didn't have our own demons, we wouldn't have either. So that's the way I well, look I, at it, you know. I want to lighten up the mood, Drew. I want to lighten up the mood as I go. I wanted to tell you guys a joke that's been going around. I don't know if you heard this joke. Uh, what's 240 pounds dashingly handsome and disappears in an instant? What? <laughs> oh, that was uh, that hey, was well done. Way to end the show. Matt Granahan, ladies and gentlemen, love you, Matt. Thanks for being a guest on the show, Kevin. Um, we, we're going to be doing Wrestle Daytona in April, um, and uh, we got a whole bunch of other stuff coming up. We have, uh, March, we, we we're coming back to a world class championship wrestling, and uh, I'm in the U- UK in February for uh, World Pro Wrestling for uh, February 19th at Cheltenham in uh, UK, uh, working with uh, um, James Mason, and uh, we got other other great talents on that show like Tajiri and uh, um, uh, Jody Fleisch. Uh, Hernandez and everything else. But in the meantime, guys, I want to thank you for joining in on In the Dungeon with Kevin Sullivan, Matty Rock, and uh, myself, the reinforcer Andrew Anderson. We had a great, great guest tonight in uh, Matt Granahan. And uh, Kevin, anything closing comments? No, I thought it was very interesting to, uh, and there were very similar stories that we were telling from the founding of wrestling to the founding of the UFC. So I thought it was a very, very interesting show. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, Andrew. And I'll talk to you guys soon. 
Much love, well, guys. And like I said, after this, I will be putting a call into the uh, the witness protection program for all yeah. of us involved. I, I feel we might need it. In the, in the dungeon, Saturday night at 9 p.m. Much love, peeps. Catch you all later. Bye-bye, guys.